I didn't have to do that last time. Okay, this is better. Okay, cool. At some point it may stop because the charge is not very good here. Okay, but let's get started. So today we're going to talk more about memory reliability and security. I'll give you some more examples of uh, some of the reliability issues. And these are going to increase going into the future as we discussed. And they become worse at high temperatures as you, you're experiencing right now. Everything becomes worse in high temperatures. And we'll talk about that actually when we talk about latency also uh, next week. And then uh, I'll talk briefly about simulation today and then we're gonna cover in-memory computation, hopefully. Okay, so we, yesterday we talked a lot about Rowhammer. Rowhammer is just one example uh, of the reliability challenges that lead to security problems. I think there are more, so hopefully uh, let's talk about some more of those. As I said multiple times during this course, DRAM is becoming less reliable, more vulnerable. Uh, and we've seen this picture multiple times also. Uh, this is true for other memory technologies as well. We're not gonna talk as much about flash memory unless we have time, but uh, we've done a lot of studies on flash memory also. This is, a, uh, this is a study of the flash memory failures on all of Facebook's servers. Facebook use, uses flash memory like many other companies in the world aggressively, especially to store hot data uh, that needs to be persistent. And we looked at the trends in flash memory errors that, that they experience over time. And the picture doesn't look good, basically. You, you see a lot of errors as you keep utilizing these devices a lot, especially at high temperatures, for example. This, this study does a lot of temperature, st uh, uh, temperature studies also. You see a lot of errors. And sometimes, actually, machines throttle themselves at high temperatures so that you don't, you don't get a lot of errors, but then you lose performance. So there's a trade-off between performance and reliability also uh, because you don't want to uh, have, uh, you don't want to keep running your disk uh, at high temperatures very fast. As a result, you lose performance because of throttling. So if you're interested in uh, how errors behave in the large scale in flash memory, this is, this is actually the first study that has done that. Later, uh, other folks like uh, Google and Microsoft published similar studies uh, like this. Okay. Uh, yeah, I said that DRAM is becoming less reliable, but that's true for actually other technologies also that scale down to small technology nodes. And I think this is very fundamental. As any technology scales down to smaller nodes, it will become less reliable because it will be more vulnerable to these lower level effects at the circuit level. Cells become closer to each other. You get electromagnetic coupling. You get other sorts of interference noise in the circuit. Uh, and quantum-like effects start appearing more. And I believe due to difficulties in such scaling, other problems may also appear, or they may also be going unnoticed, actually. Maybe there are errors that we're getting in the field today, and I believe this, actually, based on the studies that we've done, uh, that are just happening because we're not reliable enough. Some of the testing is not able to capture uh, the errors. As a result, uh, errors may be going unnoticed. Some errors may already be slipping into the field. And we know that Rohammer is already in the field. I believe some retention errors may be slipping into the field also. Uh, we'll talk a lot about retention now because this is really the fundamental limit of scaling, in my opinion, for DRAM. I think Rowhammer is very, very interesting, uh, but it's, if I have to rank things in terms of how fundamental they are in terms of scaling, I will say this is more fundamental than Rowhammer because this is a lot harder to deal with. Rowhammer, once you figure it out, I think the solution is like we discussed yesterday, there's a solution space that you can deal with. And I think probabilistic activation is one example of a solution that's really cheap. But here, I think, we're uh, hopefully I'm going to show you that it's not going to be very easy to deal with because this is going to become much, much worse going into the future. This is also going to become more worse, but I think the solutions may be easier in that case. There are also read errors, write errors. Whenever you do a read, maybe there's some noise in the circuit that lead to errors. Whenever you're doing, doing a write, write doesn't c completely finish for some reason. There's some noise in the circuit again. These errors are less analyzed in literature. We've analyzed them a little bit, but these errors are harder to analyze sometimes. Uh, and there may be other types of error mechanisms. Uh, and I think these errors can also pose security vulnerabilities, assuming that you can repeat them somehow. For example, assuming someone figures out that some particular cell is leaky and they figure out how to exercise or how to place vulnerable data to those leaky cells and then attack, uh, figure out a way of attacking those cells, uh, 
maybe they lead to security vulnerabilities. No one has done it as far as I know yet, but it's possible to be able to do it once you, once you understand the error mechanism really well. That's, that's the interesting part about uh, the link between reliability and security. This is going to get worse, I think, in memory. So we talked a lot about we disturb errors yesterday, so let's talk about retention errors today. And we covered it a little bit, but I'm going to go into a little bit more depth here to show you, the, uh, to sh to show you how interesting the problem is, actually. Uh, and there's more to do in this area. So basically, uh, as you know, uh, you need to refresh DRAM because it loses charge over time. That's, uh, the, the data doesn't get retained in a cell forever. Uh, there's a retention time that's associated with a cell. Uh, and normally, if you want to figure out the refresh rate, you need to determine the retention time of all the cells in the device and basically ensure that the cells work for a given refresh interval that you determine. And manufacturers uh, today use 64 milliseconds for DDR4. For LPDDR4, it's already 32 milliseconds. And this is temperature dependent also. At high temperatures, this goes down to 32 milliseconds for DDR4, and for, for LPDDR4, it's 16 milliseconds. And this is reducing uh, the refresh interval. But the problem is, uh, essentially, the way manufacturers determine, uh, they basically say, OK, I'm going to refresh everything every 64 milliseconds. I'm going to test the chips and figure out which chips actually fail uh, uh, when, when, I, when I refresh every 64 milliseconds. So this is really a specification, but they set the specification such that they maximize the yield that they get um, from their manufacturing process. So hopefully very, a very, very, very small fraction of the chips fail uh, uh, when, they, when they're refreshed every 64 milliseconds. So that's how they do the testing. But it's very hard to test, of course, every single cell for every single device that you manufacture. So there may be some cells that are failing that they are not capturing. Right? That's what I mean by some errors may be slipping into the field. And there is good reason to believe that this test is actually not so easy because this is getting difficult. The determining the data retention time of a cell or row is getting difficult. I say cell or row in this case because you need to know the retention time of a cell, but you, ref you do the refresh on a row granularity, right? You cannot really access a single cell in DRAM, as you know. You need to activate an entire row, and you need to precharge an entire bank or subarray, which means that refresh happens at the row granularity, but weak cells happen at the cell granularity. So if you have a row that has a weak cell, that row is essentially that row needs to be refreshed often. Okay, as I said, uh, it's, it's difficult uh, to determine the retention time. As a result, retention failures may already be slipping into the field. And this is one of the first studies we did uh, to understand uh, the, the implications of these retention failures. Like, what, is, what, uh, what affects the data retention behavior in modern DRAM devices? And actually, there's a lot of work uh, at the lower level, at the circuit level, uh, in this area that talks about the data retention behavior of the devices. Uh, but we wanted to look at how the scaling of the circuit uh, is affected by uh, things that people previously knew. And we wanted to also develop retention time profiling mechanisms that hopefully do this profiling online while the system is running to determine the retention time of a cell. Right now, all of the profiling is testing is done by the manufacturer uh, when they manufacture the chips. We want to actually move to a more online profiling mechanism so that the manufacturer doesn't have to figure out all of the errors, but the system dynamically figures out what is the retention time of different cells and dynamically adjusts the refresh rate. I'm getting ahead, a little bit ahead of myself, but you'll see the motivation for that because it's very difficult for the manufacturer to actually figure out the retention times, I believe. So uh, let me summarize. Actually, I still need to assign you some review papers, so this may be one of the papers. Let's see. Uh, let me summarize basically. There are two big challenges to retention time profiling, under, uh, figuring out the retention time of a DRAM cell. Essentially, you, you have this, these two phenomena, uh, data pattern dependence of retention time and variable retention time. They're both bad, but I think the second one is worse than the first one. So what is data pattern dependence? Essentially, this, you, you've seen this before, actually, uh, in Rowhammer, right? Uh, Rowhammer errors are much worse given some data pattern. That's true for retention time also. Basically, retention time of a DRAM cell depends on the value of the cell and the values of the, cell that are, the cells that are around it. So why does this happen? Well, essentially, this happens because you have uh, electrical coupling uh, between uh, different cells. When you activate a row, all bit lines are perturbed simultaneously. All bit lines that are connected to that row are uh, perturbed simultaneously. So these are the bit lines. These are the word lines. And when you activate a row, this row over here, uh, 
you perturb essentially all of these bit lines simultaneously because uh, the, the capacitors get connected to those bit lines and they do the shard sharing concurrently. Which means that essentially there's some electrical noise in all of the circuitry over here and you have electrical noise on this bit line, it affects the reliable sensing of a DRAM cell. And the magnitude of the noise on a bit line, let's take a look at uh, this one over here, is uh, affected by the values of the uh, adjacent cells or nearby cells because you have phenomena called uh, like bit line to bit line coupling. This is the electrical coupling between adjacent bit lines. For example, if you're actually trying to read this cell, uh, the, the noise on this bit line is affected by the values that are on these cells because these cells are also perturbing the bit lines and the bit lines are not electrically isolated from each other. Essentially, this is another type of read disturb phenomenon, right? In Rohammer, you're disturbed, you have the word line to word line coupling, but whenever you're reading a cell, you have bit line to bit line coupling also. And also, you have bit line to word line coupling. Uh, whenever you're reading this particular cell, the electrical noise on this bit line is uh, essentially affected by the noise on this word line also, the voltage that you apply on that word line. Okay, so as a result of this, uh, you, you may lose data basically from some of these cells while uh, due to these effects. Uh, and essentially the retention time of a cell depends on data patterns stored in near time, nearby cells. So what does this mean for uh, figuring out the retention time? This means that you need to find the worst case data pattern to find the worst case retention time because we're interested in the worst case retention time of a cell, right? That determines our refresh rate. Unfortunately, this pattern is, uh, first of all, we don't know what's the worst case data pattern. You need to really try or you really need to know the circuitry. But even if you know the circuitry, it may, uh, you, need, uh, you may not know the coupling capacitances between these different uh, entities over here. Uh, and it, it turns out this pattern is location dependent because the design of different parts of DRAM are slightly different from each other um, be because manufacturers try to optimize for various things. And if you re read this paper, it tells you exactly how that's different. There are some cells that are true cells, for example. There are some cells that are anti-cells. True cells mean charge, uh, charge value encodes a one. Anti-cells means char charge value encodes a zero. And the reason this happens is because you connect to the different sides of the sense amplifier so that you, you, minimize, you try to minimize the cost. And this, this paper also introduces that idea and discusses why that's there. Uh, and this pattern is location dependent, which means that you need to do a lot of testing to find this pattern. Okay, so this is one challenge. Uh, the second challenge, as I said, is worse. Uh, it's the variable retention time phenomenon. And uh, we already discussed this briefly. This is actually the uh, third phenomenon in the Samsung and Intel paper that I mentioned. Uh, the four-page paper, uh, they say this is one of the hardest things for them to handle because they do not know easily what's the retention time of a cell. And what's this phenomenon? This phenomenon is actually known since 1987. If you read the paper that, uh, we've, uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, we referenced a lot of the work on variable retention time. The first time it was discovered, it was at least written, it was it's, uh, in 1987 by Yaney. It's a very interesting phenomenon, and the idea is very simple, basically. Retention time of a DRAM cell changes randomly over time. This is a perfect example of these random effects in circuits. And this is becoming worse, as I will show you. Uh, a cell essentially al alternates between multiple retention time states. This is another way of looking at it. So why does this happen? Uh, this happens because uh, you have uh, this access transistor, and uh, this access trans sometimes this access transistor has charge trapped in it, uh, in its gate oxide. And whenever a charge gets trapped in its gate oxide, the leakage from the capacitor to the bit line is very fast. And this trapping, charge trapping process, when, whenever that trap becomes occupied, essentially charge leaks more readily from the transistor's drain, leading to a short retention time. That's the process. This is also called trap-assistant gate-induced uh, drain leakage. And it turns out this appears to be a random process. Essentially, you don't know when charge will get trapped. It happens randomly. And there are multiple works uh, from Samsung, for example, that show that this is uh, random. Basically, what is the implication? The implication is that worst case retention time of a cell depends on a random process. And you still need to find the worst case despite this. The question is, how do you do that? Right. Meaning, this means that you need to test for some time. Uh, but you need to test long enough such that you get to the point of this charge trapping happening and the trap becoming occupied so that you see the worst case retention time state. Then the question is how long do you need to test to get to that state? It actually turns out to be very, very long. 
It could be days and days. According to our results, it's, uh, I'll, I'll, I think I'll show you a picture over here, but this paper shows uh, some data related to this, showing that it's really getting worse as the, as the technology becomes smaller. So this is really a fundamental problem uh, in determining the refresh rate of DRAM. And this is exactly one of the reasons why Samsung and Intel wrote the paper together saying that we need some other solution. And this is also exactly the reason why they have error correcting codes in DRAM. And this is a perfectly reasonable place where to use error correcting codes. This is a completely random error. You may not f perfectly find out uh, your retention time, right? Okay, let's say you made a mistake. You set, you set your retention time to 32 milliseconds, which is done today but some of the cells randomly go down to eight milliseconds. If they're truly random, and if the occurrence is not very uh, high, maybe you, get a, you can get away with simple error correcting codes, right, to fix this problem. And this is the reason why uh, uh, manufacturers have added error correcting codes. They may tell you it's row hammer, but row hammer is not a good reason to add. This is really the, why, why, why we have error correcting codes in LPDDR chips, and going forward in DDR4 chips, DDR5 chips also. Okay, so let me give you some data from real devices. This is actually mm, from the da uh, data from this paper, but we've done a lot of studies later on. I'll give you some other examples. So this is, this is done at, I think, 45 degrees Celsius. Uh, at 85 degrees Celsius, leakage becomes much higher, uh, and DRAM manufacturers actually set the retention time based on the worst case temperatures usually. So you can see that the retention time is actually seconds here. Why is it seconds? Because we're testing at 45 degrees Celsius at a much lower temperature. This means that there is a lot of slack in retention time, as you can see, right? Uh, which means that when you're operating at lower temperatures, most of the cells are good. So what does this show? This shows the fraction of cells that have a retention time less than the x-axis value. And you normally get this sort of curve. So let me, uh, essentially there are multiple points to make here. It turns out newer device families have more weak cells than older ones. This is a, likely a result of technology scaling. Let's take a look at this curve, for example. D is one manufacturer, one gigabit device. It's older. And these two gigabit devices newer. And you can see that the curve has shifted to the left. What does that mean? There are uh, more cells that fail at smaller retention times that are tested. Okay? That's true for pretty much all manufacturers. As you go from an older generation device from manufacturer A to a newer generation, you see that the curve is shifting to the left. And that's a big shift, actually. And we've done other studies that show that the curve keeps shifting to the left as uh, you have more de uh, higher density DRAM chips. OK. So you, uh, you, can, you can read the paper for more. So this is another example. This is a real example uh, uh, from one of the manufacturer's chips showing the variable retention time phenomenon. Basically, we're testing for hours and hours. We're checking how long the cell can retain data. And we're recording the retention time. Again, at low temperatures, not high temperatures over here. If you go to high temperatures, this retention time scale goes down a lot. And you will, uh, the paper actually has some equations showing that uh, what, what equations you would use uh, uh, would, would fit the real devices. So this basically shows the maximum retention time we tested actually 6.1 seconds. Basically, there are no errors at this point, 6.1 seconds. But you can see that, uh, so we assume that the retention time is at least 6.1 seconds at that point in time. Uh, but you can see that uh, the retention time is not constant. It changes, right? Sometimes it's less than three seconds. Sometimes it's more than 6.1 seconds. And you see that this, uh, these changes happen at large time scales. Actually, the paper has a lot more data on the time scale. OK, this is another example. So how, how frequent? are these cells, how common are these cells that show variable retention time? So this is uh, one manufacturer's chip again. Um, this is the, uh, we plot every single cell's minimum retention time that's measured and the maximum retention time that's measured. And again, maximum retention time is capped at 6.1, I believe 6.1 seconds over here or something like that. Basically, if you don't get errors uh, at 6.1 seconds, we're assuming that uh, you, your retention time is 6.1 seconds. So if uh, if there was no variable retention time phenomenon, if every time you test you would get the same retention time, your minimum retention time should be equal to the maximum retention time. So you would get an x equals y curve over here for every single cell. But clearly that's not the case here, right? Most of the cells are actually here. So this is actually a density plot. You can see that this is uh, 
the, the darker colors indicate more cells in that particular uh, XY point. So most of the cells are actually here, which, mean, uh, which means that uh, most failing cells actually exhibit variable retention time phenomenon. And there are many failing cells that jump from very high retention time to very low. So the minimum retention time here is one point something. And the maximum retention time is six point something seconds. So they actually jump from uh, very different uh, uh, retention times. So this actually shows that the phenomenon is getting worse. And also, it is there for many chips, many cells. Any questions? The paper has more data uh, on this one. But I, I find this fascinating, basically. People knew that this phenomenon existed for more than 30 years. But uh, they never really knew uh, how bad it will get as technology scales. And this is actually, if, if you went to a DRAM manufacturer 10 years ago, for example, if you told them, I want more reliable DRAM, put ECC in your DRAM, they would kick you out of the room. Why? Because uh, adding error correcting codes costs them area. And there is no reason, no motivation for them to add error correcting codes. But this variable retention time phenomenon is has given them motivation to add error correcting codes because it's directly cutting into their business, right? Basically, uh, they cannot satisfy uh, retention times that they promise to others if they don't solve this problem. That's why they're adding error correcting codes. It's not to make DRAM more reliable. It's to keep the retention times uh, in check, uh, at least uh, to keep the retention times what they promised. But even then, the, retention, uh, the refresh rates are actually reducing. So LPDDR4 used to be 64 milliseconds, the refresh rate. Today, it's 32 milliseconds. I think in some future generation, probably it's going to be 16 milliseconds, even though we're adding these error correcting codes inside the DRAM. OK, I mean, as I said, industry is writing papers about it too. As you can see, that variable retention time is, uh, they also say, occurring more frequently with cell capacitance decreasing. Uh, so they basically validate what we said uh, earlier than uh, this paper. OK. Any questions? Is it too uh, noisy here? Yes. Oh, is it working now? OK, wow. So they could have fixed it yesterday also. Huh?